Hi. So this mini lecture is on exploratory versus explanatory data analysis. And again, I'm Kristen Hunter Thompson and one of the members of the team for this data project. So it's important to take a step back and think about the different kinds of data analysis that we do when we're working with data. And first we have exploratory, which is really when you're trying to get familiar with your data, to make sense of the data that you have, to start to dive in and see what the data maybe are showing you as you're thinking about trying to figure out what the story is from your data. So here's an example from Cole Naflick where she made up a hypothetical situation where you worked at a car manufacturing plant and you're interested in looking at customer feedback of their satisfaction across a variety of different things from different makes and models. And, and really you work, you work for the car manufacturer, so you really want your customers to be very satisfied. So here what she's done is she's grouped everything from the five Likert scale of very unsatisfied to very satisfied. Everything that's not very satisfied here is in orange and everything that is very satisfied is in gray for all the different questions that the customers were asked. So as you're teasing through and exploring and seeing what's happening in your data, this is really where exploratory data analysis is happening. You're getting a sense of what's going on in your data. Another example is from the New York Times where this was an interactive that was built out where you as the user could change what team you were looking at and change different components of this so that you could interact and get a sense of really what's, the, what's going on in the data or what's something that's of interest to you that you might wanna follow up on. And Cole Naflick talks about this, of you have to turn over a hundred rocks before you find one or two gemstones. So you're, you're turning over those rocks. You're kind of getting a sense of what's going on in the data that you have. And this is different than explanatory data analysis where there's something specific that you're ready to show or you want to show or you want to get out from your data and you want to communicate out, right? Data, remember, helps us tell stories. And so this explanatory data analysis is when we're ready to narrow in on those one or two gemstones, when we're ready to tell the stories. And this has influences in terms of how we put together our visualizations but it's also important to remember that this is often where we spend the majority of our focus and our time when we're taught about data analysis. But we can't really get to explanatory until we've had time to explore and play around. So how does this relate to our data visualizations? Well, if you're really interested in pointing out or looking, if going back to the car manufacturing example, where the steering, if things about the steering wheel, then you can make those pop out both in the subtitle for your, for your graphic, as well as what colors you're using and different visual components that can really make it pop. Like, what is it that I'm trying to explain? So another example from the New York Times is the using the same data of the number of pitches per team per game. We could also, or, or sorry, excuse me, facts about major league baseball teams through time. A way that is an explanatory data analysis is where we've already decided we want the user to look at strikeouts and that the strikeouts are increasing. And so we put that conclusion that we have from the data up into our title. And in this series, we're going to be focusing on exploratory data analysis and specifically four components, producing data, asking questions from our data and of our data, processing the data so that we can start to figure out how to answer those questions and creating and iterating on visualizations. And to give an example of what this looks like and sort of how we use visualizations in this exploratory data analysis phase, I want to give an example. So this is an example of a scientist down up at Rutgers University close by who was using glider data. And this is a glider, if you're not familiar with it, it's an underwater autonomous vehicle. And the way that it works, just to orient you to what the data are that I'm about to show you is this glider does this seesaw, this red, you know, what's depicted here by the red line, this yo-yo seesaw up and down in the water. It's not tethered to anything, it's not attached to anything. In the nose, in the front, that black front nose part of the glider is what we call it. There is a, a mechanism so that water can get brought in and get pushed out. And that changes the buoyancy and that's what leads the, the glider to be able to dive up and down. 
And then a key part is, is that in the tail of the glider, there's a satellite phone. And so scientists can release these gliders and they can go out and dive up and down throughout the oceans. And then once they come up to the surface, those data get relayed back to the computers in, in Rutgers or scientists here in New Jersey. So we can have these gliders all around the ocean collecting information for us and we can you know, sit at our computers and make, and make sense of the data. So this is the context. And so gliders go out on these tracks. So here's an example of a track that a glider took off of Southern California during the summer of 2014. The green dot that's a little tricky to see here in the middle of the ocean is where the glider started. The white track line shows you the GPS coordinates of where the glider went over the multiple days that it was out in the ocean. And then the red dot shows you where the glider was picked up. So these gliders get deployed is what we say. They get released out into the ocean. They dive around in the ocean, collecting data, sending the data back. And then at predetermined times, scientists will go back and will retrieve these gliders. So that's the context. So Felipe Carvalho is a, Dirt, while she was doing her PhD, she is now a, a researcher academic. Um, she was interested in looking at how she could use a bunch of data from these gliders from down in Antarctica to get a better sense of where there's a change in the ocean. And we call this the mixed layer depth in the ocean. So this is a what we call a profile of temperature. So temperature is increasing to the right and down into the water column, depth is going down. So we go down into the water. So this mixed layer depth is this transition zone. So she was really curious sort of where is this mixed layer depth happening? It has a biological significance because when there's changes in the density, it's hard for animals to go back and forth. And so here was one of her graphs, right? This is what a glider profile when it goes down and up will provide each time it does that red seesaw. So here on January 11th in 2011 is what it looks like. But as she went in and started looking at her data, she was looking like, you know, so from the 11th, you'd say it's around 30 meters, but looking at the 19th, just six days later, it's down here around 70 meters. So this is what spurred her curiosity and got her interested in looking at sort of what's going on. So she was looking at some initial graphs that led to some curiosity that was backed up by the biology. But now I want to show you sort of the steps that she went through to try to answer this question of kind of where is this mixed layer depth and what's going on. So the first thing that she did is she just plotted the data from every single glider profile that she had from 2010 until 2015. So each one of these dots is a piece of data from a different glider profile. She looked at this and she said, I can't really make any sense of this. And what she was curious about was what was going on in the summer. So she removed the year because it didn't matter what year the data had been collected. So here she now has sort of in January, February, and March, regardless of what year, where the mixed layer depth is, as well as across those same time periods, what the temperature was at those mixed layer depths. So this is interesting. Now she can start to see some patterns, but what she was really curious is, where do these intersect? The mixed layer depth, the average temperature, and the time throughout the summer months. Remembering Antarctica is in the Southern Hemisphere, so their summer is January, February, March. So the next thing that she did was she merged them into just one graphic where she used a color scheme to show, which is indicated here along the far right-hand side, what the average temperature was. So here she's plotted the depth and the time but the color of the dot indicates the temperature. She's thinking, okay, I'm starting to get a better sense of what's going on, but this is a lot of variation and there's still a lot of data points. Like what's, you know, what's sort of the average effect that's happening each day? So she took the averages. So for every day, she took an average of what the mixed layer depth was, and that is the location of the dot, and then what the temperature was, and that is the color of the dot. So here, right now, it's getting easier for us to see, for her to see what was going on in the data, but we can't average away all the variation. We need to include that variation. So she added the error function in two ways. So the range for the mixed layer depth for each day, she indicated by adding these standard error bars, and the range for the temperature that was happening each day, she indicated by the size of the dot, which is sort of easiest to see in this tiny little dot up here, right? Because she has two different variables that are changing. 
So now she can get a sense of that there's this, you know, up and down pattern, that there's some more variability in what the number and where that mixed layer depth is and what its temperature is at different parts in the season. And this was just one part of her figure because she was also interested in looking at wind speed. So here the mixed layer, the depth is now on the right-hand y-axis and she's added wind speed on the left-hand y-axis. So now she's starting to see what's going on, but this is actually just one of four figures that she included or one of four parts of a figure that she included in her published manuscript. And I bring this up to say that this is the reality of making these, of making that final data product, making that explanatory data visualization or knowing even what our story is that we wanna stay in our data. We have to go through these steps of tinkering and iterating, asking new questions, making new graphs to see what's going on in our data. It's that tinkering and playing and seeing what's going on is the exploratory data analysis that we'll be focusing on this semester. So what I encourage you to do is take some time. You can pause the video here and reflect on these three questions. So reflect on how do these ideas and the information that we've talked about in this mini lecture in terms of what exploratory data analysis is and how it compares to explanatory data analysis. How does that connect to ideas you already thought or knew about data analysis or working with data? So that's the first prompt. The second prompt is then to think about how has your thinking been extended or taking in new or further or deeper directions about what it means when we work with data or when we analyze, analyze our data. And then finally, what challenges or puzzles or questions have come to mind as we've been talking about and articulating a difference between exploratory data analysis and explanatory data analysis and these two necessary components of making sense and working with data to figure out what the data is telling us or what we want to communicate as a conclusion or a claim that we're drawing from the data. So pause the video where you can see these questions and jot down your ideas. Just take a few minutes to record your ideas to these three questions. And then when you're ready, you can move on. So I'd like to thank you for watching today's mini lecture. As always, please reach out with any questions or requests or comments that you have. There's my email address and you could always call my phone and leave me a message. I am here to help as you all go through this process. Thank you so much.